Good evening. My name is Ellen Lemkin. I'm a co-director of the MBL Neurobiology Advanced Course. It is a great pleasure to welcome you here tonight to our Monday night seminar series. This is a long tradition in the MBL Neurobiology course. And it's a particular pleasure because tonight is our third annual Thomas Sargent Reese lecture. Um, and to introduce Tom and the lecture, um, I invite Joanne Buchanan to come to the podium. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Ellen. I'm here to introduce the Thomas Sargent Reed Endowed Lectureship. So Tom was a member of the neurobiology course for 40 years. He taught hundreds of students over that time, and his specialty is electron microscopy. So his favorite thing was to have students sitting at the console of the electron microscope, looking at the green screen and teaching them about the beautiful ultrastructure of neurons and synapses. And he was so ge generous, he opened up his lab, used to be in the basement of the Lear building and allowed the entire course to take over, including all the students and faculty. And many people over the years have fond memories of working with Tom. So you're gonna learn more about Tom tonight from Ron Dale and their wonderful collaboration together. I also wanna thank the people who gave generous, generous donations to fund this lectureship so we can honor Tom year after year. And with that, I'm going to have Dave Dingo come up. Uh, thanks, Joanne. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker for the third Thomas Sargent Peace Endowed Lecture, Dr. Ronald David Vail. Dr. Vail has been a professor at the University of California in San Francisco since 1986 and an investigator at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute since 1995. Dr. Vail has recently been named Executive Director of the Genelia Research Campus and the Vice President of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Dr. Vail earned his bachelor's degree in chemistry and biology at the University of California, Santa Barbara. He then entered an MD PhD program at Stanford University, where he did his dissertation on nerve growth factor receptors and axonal transport. Research at the Vail lab employs biophysical, cell biological, and microscopy techniques to study the microtubule binding motor proteins, kinesin, and dynein. Together with James Spudich and Michael Sheets, he was awarded the 2012 Albert Lasker Award for Basic Medical Research for their discoveries of cytoskeletal motor proteins that convert chemical energy to mechanical work, which allow our muscles to contract, our cells to divide and migrate. And in the case of Bale's kinesin, the delivery of molecular cargo to the tip of axons. Dr. Bale is not only a scientist, but also an educator having founded iBiology, a nonprofit organization that produces and disseminates free online videos by leading biologists, speaking about biological principles and their research, as well as scientific training and professional development of practicing scientists. Ever an educator, Dr. Vail co-directed the physiology course from 2004 to 2008 here at the Marine Biological Laboratory, transforming that into an, an interdisciplinary training environment that brings together biologists, physicists, and computational scientists. Vail's recent project, The Explorer's Guide to Biology, or XBio, is a free online undergraduate textbook that provides a storytelling approach to learning biology. His lecture tonight is titled An Eye for Biological Structure, Lessons from Tom Rees. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Vail to the podium. <laughs> Well, thank you for that very kind introduction. Uh, at least I remembered what a podium is. Uh, I haven't been at a podium for <laughs> about a year and a half, but um, I guess I can take this off because other people did. Um, but I couldn't think of a, a better time to restart my, uh, oh, this is like all complicated, isn't it? <laughs> um, than by giving this third um, annual uh, Tom Reese lectureship. 
Um, it, it's a great honor for me to do this. Um, as you'll hear, Tom um, uh, is a hero of mine, uh, a great mentor and uh, a great friend. And um, it's great to talk to you here, uh, honoring him tonight. Also great to be introduced by uh, Joanne. Uh, <laughs> We have a very long uh, friendship uh, at the MBL, uh, going back to the 80s. We, we and a bunch of people shared a, a house together, um, in, including her uh, now husband, Stephen Smith. And I, I think this is something very special about the MBL that many of you will experience, that you do make uh, lifelong friendships here uh, that start at the MBL, and that's uh, part of the MBL uh, magic. So, um, yes, today I'd like, the uh, title of this lecture is An Eye for Biological Structure, uh, Lessons from uh, Tom Rees. Uh, my lecture will not be um, so much neurobiological. Uh, I'll talk about some of the early work uh, that was done with Tom but I'll then transition into some recent research that uh, uh, involves electron microscopy. And I think I probably wouldn't be doing that electron microscopy if it wasn't uh, for that experience with uh, Tom many years ago. Um, so uh, perhaps many of you uh, didn't read the abstract, but this is, uh, how I started this abstract uh, for this particular lectureship with this quote uh, from Richard Feynman. And uh, of course, Richard Feynman, a Nobel Prize winning physicist and uh, you know, quite flamboyant uh, scientist in general, uh, said it's very easy to answer many of these fundamental biological questions. You just have to look at the thing. And uh, I do believe there's actually a, a lot of truth to this. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we've now kind of uh, catapulted in this uh, age of genomics, but um, I, I think there are many believers that still view the power of seeing what biological structures look like and the incredible amount of information uh, embedded in those images. Um, now, I then continue the abstract, again, for those of you that read it, that, you know, um, I do believe what Feynman said is correct, but uh, what's missing from this quote is that it's not just so, it's not so easy just to look at the thing. I mean, it makes it sound like, well, I, 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 maybe if you're, you know, studying subatomic particles, it may sound really easy, but, um, you know, looking at things in biology is, uh, in fact, um, a real skill. Um, and in Tom's case, I would even uh, frame it at the boundary of science and art, even. Um, and what the abstract then continues is the looking involves technological innovation. Uh, it involves deep experience in sample preparation and knowing what organism and, and method is best for a particular question. Uh, it involves patience of achieving a clear and not a confusing result. And all of those things, I think, summarize uh, Tom's achievement uh, in science and as a microscopist. Um, and that's how he really stood out, that not everyone can just look at the thing. It takes all of these uh, skills to come together, um, embodied uh, in, in a great scientist like Tom, who could um, actually look at things in the way that uh, uh, basically all other scientists or very few scientists could. Um, so, uh, you know, this was, uh, uh, as Joanne said, um, uh, LURB looks very different right now, but um, the, the basement was almost like uh, uh, Tom's temple, that's the only way I could describe it. It was, it was a little bit chaotic, it doesn't look like uh, LURB now, uh, there were, it was chaotic war, you know, 
rabbit warren of rooms down there and microscopes and chemicals and all kinds of stuff. Um, but that's the environment that uh, was Tom's lab. Uh, and he was an NIH scientist, but he had a full-time lab at, um, in the Lur building. And that's where every summer he opened up his lab totally and completely to the neurobiology course students that were roaming around there doing experiments. Um, uh, and he just viewed them as a continuation of his laboratory. So your share is stuck on the first slide. You want to try re restarting the share? Yeah. You know, this is the Zoom uh, hybrid world that may be slightly problematic. Um, and I know what the problem is. And I've never tried a hybrid talk, but okay, let me let me do this, and then we may have to figure this out. But I think we'll work. In keynote, you have. All right. See, it happens when you advance the slide. Um, yeah, it's, I won't go full screen, but it it will. Um, Yeah, I can't go full screen and do this on Keynote. So anyway, I just learned about this. Okay. Um, yeah, okay, this, this will work for both audiences. Um, um, you know, I should go back to my Zoom audience and I do hope that um, Tom is here listening. And if you are, hello, Tom. <laughs> um, and yeah, so this was just the, the quote that I put up already that I guess the remote audience couldn't see, but I'll just leave it up here just for one second. So people in the um, Zoom world and maybe Tom can just uh, see this, this quote and statement. Okay, hi, Tom, I miss you. <laughs> um, I'm glad you're joining. And I'd uh, love to give you a call later. Okay, so this was also the, the slide, uh, Tom, that I showed that you couldn't see, but um, uh, Tom in two of his native environments, uh, one with um, uh, in the lab and one with uh, uh, one of his prize poodles. I don't know if this is wicked or uh, we're, we're speculating that this is wicked. But uh, also one thing that you have to know about Tom, especially when we go to uh, his science, um, when Tom decides to do something, he doesn't go halfway. And um, with science, uh, as you'll see, he, he was all in, I mean, more than all in, but he was the same way with any hobby that he took up. So, you know, like I have a pet, I have a pet dog, but you know, Tom, has, you know, prize winning uh, retriever <laughs> poodles, you know, that uh, won like competitions around the United States. Um, you know, when Tom picked up tennis, uh, you know, it wasn't for like light recreation, you know, he got a coach and he trained and trained and trained and trained. And, you know, he went from not knowing how to play tennis at all to uh, you know, really being uh, one of the best tennis players at MBL. So um, you know, that's Tom. He just has uh, he's full in when he wants to do something. He's full in and commits to it with uh, with utter passion. So um, and this is uh, just to say a little bit before I get on to our work. Uh, I just want to say a few words about, uh, I mean, Tom accomplished um, many things throughout his career, but certainly one of uh, the most important scientific pieces of work that Tom did is this collaboration with John Heuser. And I don't know if you're learning about this in the course. Uh, I hope you are. Uh, what, I, what I would say about this is, first of all, in my opinion, this is really one of the great experiments in science overall. I'm not talking about neurobiology, I'm talking about biology. Um, and 
in my view too, is also one of the incredible collaborations uh, between you know, Heuser and Reese. I mean, you think of other great ones like Brown and Goldstein, Messelson and Stahl, um, um, Watson and Crick. This was actually much longer lasting than Watson and Crick, but this was really one of the great uh, team partnerships in science that lasted many years. And you can actually um, learn about it. There's a, 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 about 11 minute lecture by Tom uh, on the heuser reese experiment on iBiology. And, and there's also um, fantastic uh, interview between Tom and John Heuser where they uh, kind of talk about their scientific partnership. But the essence of the experiment was that um, you know, one of the foundational things of neuroscience is understanding how two neurons communicate with one another um, and what the mechanism of chemical release from one neuron is to the other. And there, there were indications that that chemical release phenomena occurred a, a, as kind of quanta that stimulated uh, the postsynaptic cell. But what Heuser and Reese uh, did was really to kind of solve uh, the cell biological mechanism of how that occurred. And these sets of experiments that kind of evolved over a period of at least five years um, involved showing that synaptic vesicles indeed uh, fuse with the plasma membrane. Um, and that once released, there's a recycling mechanism involving clathrin coated pits that retrieve that membrane again, uh, allowing the synapse to, you know, uh, re-engage in repeated rounds of uh, chemical release um, through these synaptic vesicles. And um, what they did to do that is uh, also the, the latter part of the work to really demonstrate that um, synaptic vesicle fusion occurred at the plasma membrane was that they had to build um, a special device so you could not order this, but what they realized they had to do was to stimulate um, a neuromuscular junction and then rapidly freeze the sample uh, within milliseconds. Um, so, uh, because after that, the, the release mechanism already occurred and they wanted to catch it in the action. So what they did was a, a truly heroic exp experiment with this device over here, where they would um, stimulate the, um, the nerve and within literally minute, milliseconds and exactly around four milliseconds after stimulation, they could time the mechanism time when the sample hit this um, um, frozen helium cooled block and rapidly freeze this uh, sample so they could do EM. Um, and this experiment took them years to really perfect, develop the apparatus, but they knew that this was an incredibly important experiment to do. Um, they didn't, they worked on this experiment together. It wasn't a team of graduate students and postdocs. It was like Tom and John kind of working. Um, it was actually even a long-term relationship, Tom flying uh, to San Francisco to do this experiment with John. But um, uh, at, at, well, yeah, I mean, two things to know about, um, uh, both John Heuser and Tom Reese is, um, first of all, they're both incredible uh, scientists, um, but they, they also are the most <laughs> driven, they're probably two of the most driven people <laughs> I've ever met, both of them together. And when they wanted to do this experiment, there was just nothing that was gonna get in their way. And they worked on this uh, with such amazing dedication until they were able to solve this problem. And what I love, this is actually a quote from Tom as he ended this um, 
um, short 11 minute talk that he gave for um, uh, eye biology. And this really just came out of his mouth at the very end. I don't think it was even planned, but um, you know, he said at the time, because uh, they were so dedicated, they almost had no, you know, they kind of shut out a lot of other things that, of their life just to work on this experiment. And, you know, Tom said to John, um, John, why are we doing this? And he said, well, you know, Tom, the most important thing in science is to be together with a colleague at the moment when you discover something, when some little piece of nature unfolds and you see something new. And I just think this is um, incredible. And this is also just, you know, almost this quote of why we do science and why it is really so important, you know, to have this passion for really understanding what nature is and to try to, all of you as students or postdocs or faculty, or whatever, you know, to have this hunger of really discovering something new about uh, how nature works. And, you know, that is all I could say is pretty much uh, Tom Reese. Uh, he, ha he had that uh, passion. Now, now I'm gonna transit a little bit more into um, work that I did with Tom, but I should also say that in general from that Feynman quote, there are two ways to look at the thing. And one is the snapshot, single image. Um, that single snapshot is uh, often very powerful if it's done at high resolution. It's a static image. Um, and the other way to look at something is with a movie, uh, which is more obviously involving light microscopy. And, um, you know, the two together are really complement one another. And that's what I'd like to illustrate. The, the high resolution snapshot you know, together with the dynamic information of light microscopy in combination is often what lets you tease apart how living organisms work. Okay, so um, this was my uh, time with Tom um, at the MBL, uh, I think well before many of you were uh, born, nevertheless. Um, uh, Mike Sheets, who's on the left, and I came from Stanford. I was a graduate student at the time. And we hooked up with uh, Tom and Bruce Schnapp, uh, who's next to me. Yeah, that is me, hard to believe. Um, and, you know, like, like many people, Tom actually kind of took us in to his laboratory and um, uh, was excited to work with us and um, as I'll show you in a second, you know, uh, Tom's lab um, with Bruce kind of al also opened up my world to a whole new way of doing science as well. So here was the problem that we were interested in working on, and that is how material is transported down an axon, so called axonal transport. And um, um, as you know, this is a neurobiology class. <laughs> So excuse this basic drawing, but you know nerves are uh, a neuron uh, can be the uh, long uh, you know the largest cell in your body uh, by dimension. The cell body, for example, of a motor neuron is in your spinal cord, and um, nerve terminal could be a, a, at your foot, and there's a could be a one meter axon in between, and. Uh, for many years, this process was studied by injecting radioactive material uh, into the cell body. Uh, Ray Lassick did a lot of the seminal work. And then what you could see then, of course, these are static snapshots. If you did it in a rat, you have to take the uh, weight a day, for example, take the nerve out of the rat, chop it up, and figure out how far that radioactive material which was, for example, amino acids, radioactive amino acids incorporated in protein, how far it moved down the axon. So as you can imagine, those snapshots were very uh, laborious work to do. Um, and, but it was known that material could move down this axon. And in a, in a person, for example, it would take about two days to go from 
uh, the spinal cord down to your foot over that kind of dimension. Okay, so uh, uh, making a long story short, but like many things in biology, you have to pick a, a good model organism for a question. And uh, a good model organism for this question of axonal transport was a squid. Um, slightly different reasons, but for the same reasons that Hodgkin and Huxley used the squid. Uh, it was possible to dissect out the squid, uh, the axon, the giant axon from the squid. Squid have uh, this axon that's about 50 times larger in diameter than a human axon. Um, you can actually see it with your eye, you can dissect it out of the squid and you can study it. Um, now, uh, Hodgkin and Huxley were more interested in the membrane and not and kind of threw away the inside of it. But uh, at, at this time in the early 80s, people were interested in what was happening inside the axon for uh, how material moved. Um, and there were many people here working on this problem and a particularly exciting thing uh, that happened in this era was really a revolution in light microscopy, um, which was quite amazing because all of you take it for granted now that you're using microscopes and their fancy cameras and computers and robotics and all of this kind of stuff. Some of the microscopes even now look like black boxes. You don't even know what they look like. They do everything for you now. But there was an era, believe it or not, when you actually looked through your eyepiece of the microscope. Um, and, uh, there, and at this era, there were two groups, uh, Shinya Inoue, um, you know, uh, two real giants of microscopy, uh, Shinya Inoue and Robert Allen, who, um, um, uh, and Rudolph here was from Shinya's lab, worked with Shinya for many years, so you could talk to him about Shinya's many achievements. But, um, oh, the, uh, the Shinya scope? Oh, it's in the Lily Lobby. Okay, oh, that's great. I have to check that out. So you can see one of the historic microscopes that Shinya built in the lobby of Lily. Anyway, uh, with the, uh, these two individuals, they did many things, but relevant for this, what they did is to put, instead of looking at the eye, they put, uh, at that time, analog cameras on a microscope and um, also developed uh, ways of uh, uh, increasing with some like kind of simple, um, even at the time, analog based uh, electronics to amplify the contrast level um, from the camera images in ways that you could see much higher contrast in the sample than you could ever see by eye. So um, what you see here is a movie made by Robert Allen with one of these uh, video enhanced contrast microscopes. And if you look at the squid giant axon with your eye, with the same microscope, you would see almost nothing. But with the, with the camera and the contrast enhancement that could be achieved, this is what um, Robert Allen saw, which was the inside of the axon was full of life and things were moving up and down. Now, this basically in like five minutes, completely replaced all the dynamic information that you would get from a radioactive tracer experiment. Because here was this rich movie image where you could see everything that was going on in the axon. Now also compare you know, the static image, which also um, uh, Schnapp and Reese were working on at the time. And this is shows an electron micrograph, which they were looking at what the inside of an axon looks like. And uh, you can also see from this that, um, you know, realization that the inside of the cell is not a bag of liquid at all. In particular, the axon is absolutely packed with material. Most of this, what you see here is neurofilaments. Some of it is uh, microtubules. Um, but it's an incredibly uh, dense uh, environment of fibers. This was the movie that you saw, you know, from um, um, the Allen group. 
And, you know, I still think it's a fascinating, um, I still think it's a fascinating problem today, even to understand how material can move through this, um, you know, jungle of filaments right now. And there are probably even dynamics of how these filaments are, you know, moving and how what you see as static cross bridges between filaments here must have some dynamic flavor as well to let material pass through it. Okay, so um, after that, uh, one thing that um, Robert Allen's group did and we also did with Tom was to begin to try to uh, tease apart this system in a test tube. And what you could see here is now the squid giant axon uh, out of the squid and out of the axon and the material kind of mixed up and put on a microscope slide. And now here with this video microscope, which now uh, Bruce uh, Schnapp uh, built in Tom's lab, you can uh, see these now discrete filaments and that's a mitochondria that's moving its way down the middle of the screen over there. These long sausage shaped things are mitochondria and a whole variety of small filaments. Um, uh, and now I'll take a pause because we, we put some of that work of how we made that prep, but I want to tell you something else about Tom. Tom was the perfectionist of an image. I've never known anyone like it. Joanne's laughing, but you know, like he had a, a full-time person that produced uh, photographs in the dark room for all of the electron micrographs that he published or even the light micrographs. And um, uh, he would have this person work in the dark room. Now this is, you know, pre-digital, right? Work in the dark room, just getting the contrast, right? Um, and would produce like literally like could be a hundred uh, prints to get the one that showed, you know, the kind of contrast and detail uh, that he felt he could see even in the, the negatives or with, with the image. So every image that Tom produced in print well, was kind of like a work of art. But now going back to the science, uh, this, what we saw under the video microscope at the time was some filament. We had no idea what the filament was. It, um, by the light microscope, there is no information there. All these filaments appear at the resolution limit of the light microscope, which is about 250 nanometers. They could have been bundles of actin, they could have been microtubule, or could have been a bundle of microtubules, combination of actin and microtubules, we didn't really know. So here's my second uh, uh, heroic experiment to tell you about. And this is an experiment that Bruce Schnapp and, and Tom did. And largely I was an extra pair of hands <laughs> and watching in admiration along with Mike and they really did everything that I'm gonna tell you about. But the heroic experiment was to first um, uh, shadow a, with carbon uh, on a glass cover slip, a, um, a grid pattern uh, now this grid pattern was like a little map. So you could uh, find uh, any corner or any square of that grid would have a coordinate system that you can go back and find later. And the experiment uh, started by taking the squid giant axon and putting it on that glass cover slip, putting it in the light microscope and then watching it. And then you can see things moving along filaments uh, what I should say is a lot of these preparations, uh, you know, necessarily didn't work. Um, but then ones that worked well, uh, to transfer that from the light microscope to that freezing apparatus that I showed you to rapidly freeze it and, um, and, and then etch it with metal and then look at it under uh, the electron microscope. And the goal was to find a filament that we could see with a clear pattern under the light microscope and then 
go to that same coordinate system and find the exact two same filaments under the electron microscope. Um, and in my memory, although I'm trying to remember if Bruce said it was even a larger number, in my memory, it took 43 attempts uh, to get this experiment to work. And, you know, just one thing or the other prevented it from working. It was, it, there were many, many steps in the sample preparation to get to this final point. But then as in a perfect Tom Reeson experiment, if you do the experiment right, you get a definitive answer and there's no question about it. And, you know, that again was, um, you know, I told you about synaptic vesicle release and recycling. Here, the image again was absolutely definitive. Um, the, uh, the first sample, and then of course we did more th than that as well, showed that these filaments were single microtubules. And also what was interesting about that was that single microtubules supported organelles moving in two directions. So that indicated that even a single microtubule filament was a two-way highway. So um, anyway, that was an incredibly beautiful experiment, an important experiment. It told us uh, what the substrate for movement was. And that information allowed then me to use some of my expertise that I learned at Stanford as a graduate student, uh, where I learned how to also purify proteins and reconstitute things. I learned a lot of biochemistry there. I learned microscopy at the MBL and you know, that combination allowed the discovery of, of kinesin in, in Tom's lab. And that also proved to be a, a very, this combination of biochemistry and microscopy basically has driven kind of a lot of my research ever since. But this just shows the nature of the experiment and why that EM was so important. What you're seeing on the left here is that same image. Here we didn't know what those filaments were, but when we knew that they were microtubules, now with biochemistry, we could get microtubules actually from another source, from a pig brain, purify the tubulin and reconstitute microtubules that are absolutely clean. They don't have anything else on them. There are no other associated proteins, clean microtubules. And what you see on that right image is um, a, uh, some of those purified microtubules in lines over there. Uh, so that's part of reconstitution. You want to purify things if you can. But the other thing interesting about this experiment that I'll show you is um, a long story, but we were able to get rid of the native organelles, all those mitochondria and small vesicles. And instead of organelles, replace the organelles with plastic beads and found that these plastic beads um, picked up some motor uh, in what was a kind of a soluble fraction, has lot, basically a fraction that had lots of uh, free soluble proteins from the squid axon. Some of those proteins would stick onto those beads and they would move these beads, plastic beads, just like organelles. And um, this reconstitution basically then led to biochemical fractionation of finding what protein caused those beads to move. Um, so, and that led to the discovery of, of kinesin um, um, in Tom's lab. I'll say a word about how uh, motor proteins produce motion. They basically take a high energy uh, chemical, ATP. They hydrolyze the uh, gamma phosphate bond, then they release phosphate, they release the ADP. And um, during one of these chemical cycles, as I'll show you in a movie, what the motor does is it takes a step and it hydrolyzes another nucleotide, it takes another step. So this chemical cycle uh, gets coupled to the motor stepping along tubulin subunits along the microtubule. But the question is, how does a motor protein do that? And to solve that pro problem, I will still use the phrase, you just look at the thing. Um, and 
here, uh, for example, just looking at the thing is an image of a horse uh, galloping. This was a famous uh, um, high-speed videography made in the 19th century of watching a horse gallop. And there was a debate about whether the horse had its feet off the ground or always had a foot on the ground. And anyway, this movie illustrated how the horse moved. So uh, again, this solving this problem was a combination of, um, oh no, um, I have a power problem here. Or there will be about to be a power problem. No, oh wait. I think we're good. We're good. We're good. I think we're good. So, um, you know, the two approaches here basically to solve how a motor protein takes a step was to look at the thing and it had to look at it in two ways. One is looking at it at very high resolution snapshots. And that uh, was either cryo EM, uh, which was not as high resolution at the time as it is now, but that provided some information or getting X-ray crystal structures. That gave us static images. And the second element was getting dynamic images of what this motor protein was doing at a single molecule level. And I'll, I'll talk to you about that later. But the combination of that high resolution information allowed one to actually make, this is based upon atomic resolution information know exactly what the microtubule looks like, how the motor binds to the microtubule, what all the details of the chemistry that is happening in the active site uh, could understand that. So this animation is really based upon high resolution snapshots. And this dynamic information here was based upon putting probes on this motor protein to understand some of the dynamics of the steps that, that you see here and also some of the conformational changes that occurred. Now, I'll tell you one last story and then I'll, I'll try to move into modern times. Although I'm somewhat slow here, but um, tell you a little bit about some recent work. But here's another uh, story that if Tom is watching this, he probably will remember this. And um, that is, uh, I've kind of reenacted this in my own house with a paper napkin, but uh, for a while we could only get unidirectional motion um, from that, that bead preparation that I showed you. You could see all those beads were moving in one direction and that was the kinesin direction. One day by a long story by a mistake, we kind of made a mistake in the way we prepared those soluble proteins from the giant axon. And that was actually a time that Tim Mitchison uh, was visiting the lab at Woods Hole. But sometimes accidents or mistakes or when you do something not quite right in the lab could turn out well. We made an, a kind of an error in that preparation and we, made a preparation that showed something different. The beads were now moving bi-directionally. And um, uh, I was so excited about this because we were looking for a possibility of another motor. And I put this sign on Tom's door. Um, and then Tom was like <laughs> overjoyed and thrilled. And he also kept that paper towel on, on his door, I think uh, for years and years and years. Um, but it, it is kind of these joyful moments where, where, you know, you, you can share some discovery and, um, it was also fun that Tom kept that paper towel for quite a long time, uh, on his door. Now, so we knew that there was another motor It moved in the opposite direction. Uh, it had characteristics of dynine and a year later, um, uh, Richard Valley showed that indeed it was dynein that from cytoplasm that there was the minus N directed motor. So kinesin goes in one direction, dynein goes to the other. And 
What I should say is that dynein was actually a known motor. It was discovered many, many years ago, um, and it, it was involved in, um, in ciliary beating. Um, so dynein has a form that's present in your axon and a, and a form that's present in cilia. And I'm looking at, at the time now, and I think I'm just gonna tell you one story, but the reason I, I, I showed that is our lab uh, shifted from working on kinesin. We were understanding the details of how that worked. We then um, uh, uh, shifted our lab to work on dining. It was also a very exciting time in the lab. Um, had a chance to work with another one of my uh, great heroes and mentors, Ian Gibbons. Ian discovered dining in 1965. Um, and he moved to the Bay Area and we had a, a very nice chance to work with him. Uh, and also a great group of postdocs joined the lab to work on these problems. Um, uh, I don't need to work on dining anymore because they're all off on their own labs doing uh, amazing things. But um, also I just wanna show you, this is what dining looks like in comparison to kinesin. So it is a massive, motor protein. It's one of the largest uh, proteins encoded by the genome. So it's a, it's a monstrous uh, machine. The ATPA site is in that ring structure in the head. And um, it has this long coil coil stalk, almost like a stilt going down to a foot. And it's this tiny foot that's actually uh, stepping along the microtubule track. Um, and I did have two stories here, but um, I'm, I think I'm just gonna show you, uh, I'll skip the dynamic story and I'll, I'll talk to you about uh, this recent work that we're doing because it involves um, EM, which is Tom's obviously favorite thing. So I'm gonna skip through this. This is a bunch of data of dining, uh, how we measure dynamics of dining, but I am going to skip that. This, believe it or not, could have gone very fast. I'm just gonna show you the movie. So uh, interesting thing about how we think dining works is in kinesin, the two heads are, are coordinated. You can see it and it steps in this regular pattern. Here, best of our understanding is that the two heads of dining work very independently. They're somewhat chaotic. Um, in fact, sometimes dining moves uh, backwards as well as forwards. Um, the heads, dining can move to lateral protofilaments. So it has a very, very different kind of walking mechanism than kinesin. But let me just tell you a problem that I think is really exciting in this field right now. And one that I think um, electron microscopy is already, um, providing many answers. And I think maybe in the next few years, this is a time when this problem um, may actually be solved. And, and that is uh, how um, cilia and flagella work. So dynein is a motor that is moving cilia and flagella. This is a clamidomonas that you see here that shows the beating pattern of these cilia. And this beating pattern is produced by this um, incredibly interesting and complicated machine. It's really um, one of the most elegant and to some extent still mysterious structures in biology, uh, which is this axoneme. And it's made up of microtubules. You probably have seen this from uh, biology classes, but it has these nine outer doublet microtubules uh, surrounded by a central pair. And this is conserved through evolution from ancient unicellular organisms to man. Um, and uh, it, it's made up of uh, hundreds of proteins. Um, and how this machine works is, is still very poorly understood, but I, I, I could illustrate what uh, the dynein motor is doing. The dynein motor is located on these outer doublets and 
these dynenes are interacting with and walking along the neighboring outer doublet. Um, now we know that's true because Gibbons did an old experiment many years ago of um, taking the membrane away from the axoneme and lightly trypsinizing all of these bridges between that connect these outer doublets. And what he found is he added ATP and these microtubules would slide past one another. So the microtubules would just, neighboring outer doublets would just undergo this linear motion and just slide. Is it? Uh, God, it's, yeah. It's working. Okay. Oh, I must be something wrong with my power cord. Hmm. Okay. Thank you for saving the day there. Ellen, appreciate that. Um, so back to electron microscopy, and this is what I'll talk about. I think, you know, you've probably seen drawings like this in your textbook. And now is a time where really electron microscopy is shining that we can now see uh, what these structures really look like, uh, you know, approaching now, even in the whole axoneme, close to atomic uh, level resolution. Um, so I'll give you um, 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 a couple uh, recent pieces of work, both involving electron microscopy, of trying to understand the structure and how it works. Um, so in addition to the dynein that, that I showed you that's interacting between these outer doublets and causing them to slide, there are these interesting uh, radial structures here that point to the center of the axoneme and they are called the radial spokes. And somehow these radial spokes are required for converting the sliding motion into a, a beating pattern. Um, because you can imagine if all the dynenes are walking at the same time, um, no one's gonna be getting anywhere and you can't create um, you know, a beating pattern. Dynenes have to be active on one side of the waveform and inactive on the other. And somehow these radial spokes are uh, responsible for converting dynene between active and inactive states to allow this beating pattern to occur. And if there are mutations in the radial spoke or they're absent, the, the flagella is completely um, immotile. So there's something about this particular structure um, that is required for creating these kinds of mechanical based oscillations. So to understand the radial spokes, uh, what, what Iris did was to, um, uh, reconstitute 12 proteins, express them in uh, baclovirus, purify the proteins. This is a pretty monumental experiment just to purify 12 proteins. And um, then was able to uh, do a single particle cryo EM and get a structure of what this um, uh, radial spoke head looks like. So that's that little ball that you see at the very end of that structure. And we're right now looking at it um, head on. If you were the radial central pair there, this is what you would see uh, that particular surface there. Um, and one thing that's uh, very interesting about that surface, so this is the surface that's contacting uh, the radial spoke to the central uh, pair structure is the end of this uh, radial spoke head, first of all, is amazingly flat. It's pretty actually hard to create even a, a structure that is so molecularly flat. That's one interesting thing. So this is looking at it like the head of the anvil and this is like the side of the anvil. Uh, and the second thing is that this, um, uh, this face there is highly negatively charged. The, the red is negative charge blue is positive charge. That whole face there is negatively charged. Um, 
the reason why I should give you the punchline, the reason why, why we think that is probably true is that um, when the axiom is bending, we think that these radial spoke heads are actually mechanically hitting this central pair and that mechanical like collision is involved in some kind of mechanical feedback that is controlling the dyneme. Um, and if you want these mechanical collisions to be elastic, uh, we suspect that they're, although we don't know what the structure is like in the central pair, that there may be a matching surface of, of also negative charges on the central pair that prevent these protein structures from basically sticking to one another and elastically recoiling. So these negative charges are, are highly conserved. And, um, and one experiment that we did, then Iris did in uh, Clamidomonas was to change some of those negative charges to either neutral charges or positive charges and test this theory, whether these negative charges are important, uh, put this mutant back into the clammy and uh, would see what happened. And this is a wild type clammy over here. You could see it's swimming uh, just fine. And this is the mutant clammy now where these um, uh, uh, mutant uh, radial spokehead protein that had the charge changed at the surface. You can see that the, the swimming pattern of these, it still swims, um, but not swimming as well. Um, and you can just see that if you analyze the images over here. Um, so um, uh, Iris also looked at uh, um, uh, mutations in the radial spoke head. So it, it turns out that there are human diseases that are called primary cilia dyskinesias. They often uh, have problems with respiratory cilia um, so have bronchitis, uh, infections, sperm um, in males are often um, uh, dysfunctional. And there are a lot of families right now with these uh, point mutants. And um, um, Iris also then began to put these human point mutants into her recombinant protein and ask, can she see any difference of um, what these point mutants, these human disease mutants would uh, affect the protein complex. And the bottom line is that um, a lot of these point mutants here, um, even a single point mutant here can um, by EM entirely uh, disrupt the particular structure. And that was a dramatic mutant, but um, uh, some of the other point mutants that still produce um, protein structures, if one does uh, what's called a thermal denaturation, which tests how stable the protein is, um, this is what a wild type protein looks like. It, it melts at about 42 degrees or it starts to unfold. Protein structure starts to unfold, but these human disease mutants uh, push the denaturation of the protein to lower temperature. Um, so the bottom line is we think a lot of these human disease mutations are really protein stability mutations and are, uh, are somehow affecting the uh, stability of this entire uh, radial spokehead structure. Um, and lastly, and I'll make this very short because I realize I've run a full hour, but um, we're also using um, uh, cryo-EM to look at the mammalian uh, sperm. Um, mammalian sperm, a lot of people have studied clamidomonas and these ciliated epithelial cells, but um, mammalian sperm have been very poorly um, studied by cryo-EM. And the sperm structure is also very different. Uh, that's to scale, that that's, is a, um, uh, a mouse sperm, it's about 100 microns long. And um, compared to a clamidomonas, that little flagella is only 10 microns. So it, it's, a, it's a very, very different structure. 
and um, uh, Zhen Chen in the lab with a group at Genelia have been asking, are there any differences in the axoneme structure between mammalia and cilia and flagella? And what they've been using is a technique called uh, cryo-EM tomography. Um, that's a, I'll just go to this slide, basically a technique where you can create a very thin structure of the axoneme on ice. You take uh, pictures at multiple angles and then you can use those multiple angle pictures to reconstruct uh, a 3D image of what that axoneme looks like. And that was the image at, at, at in great detail. And um, what Jen has found so far, and this is uh, all unpublished work, is that there are structures in sperm flagella that have never been seen before in other kinds of cilia. So this is just, one example here, um, this is an outer doublet over here. Um, um, so these are the, looking at the inside of the two outer doublets. Um, and this is the same structure in uh, a cilia. This is from tetrahymena, but they all look fairly much the same. And what Jen has found is that the sperm has a completely uh, a, a new structure, an additional structure that is sitting inside of one of the tubules. And I'll just show you what that looks like in this, in this um, image over here. Oh, shoot. So this is what this uh, filament looks like. Um, so it's an entire mysterious second filament residing inside the microtubule. Um, we think it may have something to do with the mechanical needs of this mammalian sperm being so long. Maybe this adds extra rigidity to it, but um, it's a new structure that uh, you know hasn't been seen and we're gonna have to figure out what kind of proteins make up that structure. And I'll, I'll try to be brief here, but he's actually found kind of a gold mine of additional structures in mammalian sperm that do not occur in uh, axonemes from cilia. So um, here's just another example. These are the radial spokes that I showed you. Here are the flat heads. And in, um, in the sperm structure, there are these you know, quite large additional structures here that we, we um, actually don't understand what they are, what they're made out of, uh, or what they're for, but they have something to do with the very specific uh, movement of, of cilia. And I think I'll just skip this. Um, and I'll, I'll just tell you what I think right now is, is the big problem in this field, which is, you know, what I alluded to. Um, this is the radial spoke head that I, I showed you before. It's contacting the central pair. And these are the dyne motors in, in purple here that are somehow being turned on and off based upon some kind of mechanical interaction between this radial spoke head and, and that big central pair structure. And, you know, this is the big question in the field right now, which I don't have the answer to, but somehow there must be some signal being transmitted, probably even mechanically from, um, this central region where these collisions are occurring to change the structure of this dynein so it's being turned on and off uh, during this mechanical wave beating. And um, so I, I think that's the next question that we'd like to know, probably again using um, 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 electron microscopy to see if we can see that kind of structural change uh, that must be occurring. And uh, probably some, all of these structures along this journey to this final dynein molecule are changing in subtle ways to, con to relay um, uh, some signal to turn the motor on and off. And I think if we understand that uh, just by looking at the thing, then maybe we'll understand uh, how silly and flagella work. Um, so no answer as of yet. 
But uh, I'll just close by saying, first of all, thank you, Tom. Uh, I owe a lot of my career to Tom. Uh, he took me in along with Mike Sheets as a graduate student to be able to work on that problem. I really learned the beauty of microscopy from, from him. At Stanford, I was trained as a biochemist and I came to MBL and I became a microscopist. And uh, I, I, I really owe that um, uh, to Tom. Um, and I've learned a lot of how one can study biology just by looking at the thing. And I'd like to, I didn't have a chance to talk about Stefan's work, but Jen and Iris are doing this uh, recent work on, um, on sperm and, uh, and the axoneme and trying to understand their structures. And i um, sorry for going a little long, but anyway, thank you for your attention. So any questions? Yeah. Hey, Is that Tony? I can't, I can't, I can't tell anyone here, you know, wearing masks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, the the question is, is that filament, the sperm is very long. Um, the, the axiom in the sperm is very long and it has even kind of different parts to it. Um, um, that is a good question. I don't know whether that is kind of in the middle region. It's not, I mean, there's a region that's closer to the head, you know, the mid piece where there are mitochondria. Um, I, I mean, maybe Jen knows the answer. I don't. I, I think it's present for much of the length of the axoneme. You know, whether it extends all the way to the very base of the axoneme, you know, close to the head, I don't know the answer to that. Oh, I see, to the tip. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I, I don't know the answer. Um, I don't know the answer to that or whether he's really looked at the far ends of the axoneme. Actually, great, that's a great point about the tip. So I'm, I'll pass that along. So thanks, Tony. It's good, good suggestion. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I, I, the, the one question I had was about the, um, what did you say about the ATP going? Yeah. Well, I mean, the dining itself is creating a linear um, motion upwards. It's trying to push one of the um, I mean, interesting thing is they're connected at the base, at a basal body, but the, the dynein is actually sliding microtubules towards the tip. So it, um, it, the dynein itself is not really creating any kind of circular motion. It's just trying to push, trying to push its neighboring microtubule towards the tip. And that is what happens. So, so if you proteolize everything, what you see is these microtubules just sliding to the tip. Um, um, what I should say, there's also a, a very nice piece of work of, um, from Danielle Nicastro's lab, which I didn't describe, but which I, I showed you in that movie of dining. I, I showed that animation of dining walking. Um, I didn't really go into it, but part of that dining was colored yellow and red. And there was part of the dining that had an arm and it was changing its state. 
the position of that arm, you could tell whether the dynein is kind of in a waiting state or an active state. Um, the work by Nicastro suggests, interestingly, and this is was surprising to many people, a lot of people thought that dining may be inactive and only on the side that is creating the bend would the would on one side would the dining be active. It it looks like the opposite is true, that most of the dinings are in around the axoneme are in an inactive state. So they're all trying to move upward towards the um, tip of the flagella. They're all trying to move their neighbor, which doesn't really get you anywhere. Uh, but her, her study suggests that dining on one side to create a bend, dining is actually being inactivated. So something is inactivating the dining. The dining on the rest of the circle is active and the dining that's inactive kind of loses out and basically a bend gets created there. But anyway, the, the motion is actually trying to move, move towards the tip. Yes. Um, there's a oh. comment in the Q&A from uh, Carolyn Smith that says, hi, Ron. Um, Hello. <laughs> I'm in Georgia, talk very much, but we can't get the audio going for SAQ. OK. <laughs> that's that's very nice. Well, Tom, you created uh, plenty of magic for many people, not just me, but uh, rooms full of students, just like we have here today. So anyway, that was uh, anyway. Hello, Carolyn, and um, and and hi, Tom. And it's I know it's still a little bit of a obviously an unusual summer here. But um, do hope all the students will also come back to MBL on another year too, because I'm sure you're getting your dose of magic this year, but um, especially compared to last. But you know, this is an amazing place where you know um, I don't know, just magical conversations happen, and everyone is is uh, especially in the summer, just kind of remembers why they fell in love with science in the first place. You know, um, not necessarily trying to get the next figure of your paper done or get your grant out or whatever it is that keeps us busy in our other lives and home institutions. Everyone just, you know, comes here kind of for the the raw pleasure of talking about science or getting a crazy experiment to work or spending the time to talk to people, which, you know, we don't do enough, uh, I think, at our home institutions, but somehow it does happen here. So it is a magical place. And, uh, and I think Joanne was right. I mean, Tom, like, would be in there in the no-biology court, you know, holding court over you know, uh, an electron microscope with both working on the scope but also educating students at the same time. And, you know, that's what education is all about. Okay, thanks, I want to thank everyone for attending. Uh, we hope you'll consider registering for other lectures in the series. Also, our Friday evening lecture series has gone virtual once again this year, and we hope you'll consider registering for Clifford Brangwin's lecture this Friday, July 9th. Thanks again, everybody.